Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good to see you. I am excited to hang with you guys again. Thank you very much, um, as always, to Backstage and their incredible team uh, that helps us uh, put this together. Good, just wanna make sure that you guys can clearly um, hear and see me. So if I can get a thumbs up on that, uh, that would be great. We got a couple familiar faces as always coming in. Uh, good, loud and clear, thank you. Matt, April, all right. Some of our um, amazing crew is here and uh, we welcome everybody uh, watching this right now. So good, we're just getting situated. Take a second for everybody to come on in. And um, great, excellent. Good. I hope you guys hope you guys are well and um, taking good care of yourselves, staying healthy. Um, I'm excited for this topic. Some of you guys who uh, we work together, we talk about this quite a bit. And why the stage directions were never your acting instructions. So really psyched uh, to dive into this. So thank you again to Backstage for creating. Glad you guys can hear. We're going to be doing some really fun uh, Q&A towards the end of this, so hang tight. And if you're live, we're going to get a chance to... Um, to chill and I'll answer some questions and we'll, we'll sit with each other for a little bit. Um, I've been collaborating with Backstage for many years and all of my articles and videos are archived on Backstage and Backstage's YouTube for you guys to enjoy. Um, take a look at the past videos because there's a topic for almost uh, everything. We still have a lot of cool stuff that we're gonna be doing in the weeks ahead. I'm Joseph Perlman. And at my studio, we help actors launch their careers faster and reach Oscar potential award level performances on set. And as always, at my studio, we believe you can launch your career faster, your careers faster and with less effort when you're lit up with fun. And I always say you can do anything else a lot faster and more with more impact when you're lit up with fun in your lives. And we have private coaching and online Zoom classes from Hollywood to anywhere in the world for beginners to celebrity actors and in between. And you guys are all invited to watch the acting, career, breakthroughs and transformations live from anywhere in the world to attend a free audit. So wherever you guys are, just like this, you can be a part of one of our classes for free. And I'm coaching these incredible actors on currently casting major film and TV auditions, booked roles, to make the fun and brave choices to stand out and guarantee a win in an audition room and on set. Now, we're gonna dive into our topic, but what does it mean to guarantee a win? It's guaranteeing a win when you go on set, uh, you wanna make brave choices to stand out that light you up and have impact on your partners. But in an audition room, guaranteeing a win, he's going into every room and getting that result after the interview of you and after the performance of either you, you book the role right away or you get a call back or a producer session or a chemistry read or production and casting fall in love with you and bring you back in over and over and over again because you keep solving problems in the room until you book something. So any one of those is a guaranteed win and it's possible to control that. So welcome aboard. I think we have a lot of folks uh, who just came in right now. We're going to be hanging out, doing some Q&A at the end. And thank you for letting me speak with you guys every other week here. And so great to see so many friends and family and studio members. And we welcome you from, uh, if you're new, from all over the world. So why the stage directions were never your acting instructions. That's one of those things that a lot of actors didn't know. And I think I want to clear up some, some myths, um, some mind viruses or stories of suffering here first. Why are the stage directions, why were they never your acting instructions? And a lot of actors think that they were and they obey those stage directions. And what happens is it leads to the actors doing the same performance as everybody else. 
and production and casting are going to see the same choices and the same performance as every other actor that came in the room. Stage directions are often part of a writer's pitch to help producers get a sense of what could be. They were in no way your acting instructions. They're not for you to obey, but they are not to be ignored either. I'm not telling you to ignore the stage directions. I'm just telling you that they were never your acting instructions. So stage directions, like I said, are part of a writer's pitch, almost to a producer. Sort of imagine what it could be. Character description, those were never your acting instructions either. That block of information that describes your character, age range or possible ethnicity or you know, emotional attributes, etc. Character descriptions are typically written by the company that provides the breakdown, breakdown services, or other companies that create a breakdown uh, for casting to deliver to actors. Character description is also written by casting, and it's to help you understand the world of the piece. Hey there, Brett. Good to see you from Atlanta. Very cool, Nathaniel. So character description typically written by breakdown services are casting to help you understand the world of the piece so you get how people behave. Now, when you're you know, going up for an audition in a project, you should watch that project if you can. Sometimes you're not able to watch it because it's new or it's a pilot, but you want to understand the world of it. We call that style. So you can understand the structure that you get to go crazy inside um, and you can behave accordingly. It's one of the first questions we ask is that of style. And that character description is about style. So again, your stage directions or action directions, whatever you want to call it, and your character descriptions were never meant for you to obey as an actor. As always, it's important to absorb them, but you need to find your version of it. Remember, 90% of the performance is the personality. 90% of your success potential is your personality. You never want to do it the way that you think you're supposed to do it. Um, you never want to play um, you know, the Prince of Denmark. You never want to try to figure out how to play Hamlet. Your job is to figure out under what conditions would it be possible for you to feel those things um, because you can relate and infinitely relate to experiences that are not your own. So unfortunately, a lot of actors don't know this and it leads to a lot of obvious choices. And here's why, here's where that myth comes from. So we've often heard, typically in drama school or conservatory, that when it comes to plays, it's best to cross out the punctuation and the stage direction. And why do we do that? Crossing out the punctuation and the stage direction for plays um, because it's oftentimes representative of what the first cast did. It was written in based on what the first cast of actors did. So why would you want to match your actions to the choices of another cast of actors or another actor? So with plays, that's what we're often told. The exception being certain plays where stage directions are integral, integral to the style, like Samuel Beckett. The stage directions are part of the play. So you need to understand sort of which, which playwrights um, you need to obey. And I would say Samuel Beckett is a, is a glaring example of somebody whose stage directions are part of the clowning work of the play. So you don't want to cross those out in a play. And we're told that in drama school or conservatory that stage directions or action directions in film and TV scripts should not be crossed out and, and should be obeyed. This is false, this is not true. Again, they shouldn't be ignored, but they were never your acting instructions. So let's start this process with one of the, one of the first great questions you need to ask yourself when getting any script, whether it's a play or whether it's a film. You need to ask yourself, what's the obvious choice? What's the trap? What is every actor going to do to do the same darn performance that everybody else is going to do? And how do you find that? Well, it's like you can simply ask yourself, what heavy lifting is the text doing that I don't have to do? Does that make sense? 
what is the text doing that I'm released from responsibility of? I don't have to do that. So that's a good, a good way in uh, to find that. So you really, you really want to clear your desk of what you don't want before we construct what we do want on it. And I want to, I want to come back to this. So in life versus some of the acting training that we do, I'll let you guys answer this. How often is what we say, the words we say, a direct match for what we feel and what we mean? How much of what we really feel as our animal selves are we speaking? Um, anybody, anybody, anyone to take a stab at that? Not a lot for the most part, okay? It's, it's maybe more, but like, you know, we don't say 90% of what we're feeling oftentimes. And sometimes we don't say 100% of it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a lot more. Some of you guys are taking some good stabs at this. Almost nothing. Yeah, I agree, Matt. And good to see you. Yovan, great to see you as well, too. Uh, rarely, Brett as well. Alessandra, almost never. Absolutely. So in life versus acting. So why in acting? Why are we emotionally obeying the text? Why are we doing that? Stop emotionally obeying the text in the name of doing justice to the writing. So I often hear this, but, but don't you want to do justice to the writing? Well, you're doing less justice to the writing by emotionally obeying everything that's said when in life what we feel and what we mean versus what we say are these separate events. So I, I want to pull the veil off of this thing. It's going to really supercharge your acting performances and it's going to push them to the edge of danger and possibly beyond. So stop emotionally obeying the text in the name of doing justice to the writing. What you say versus what you mean are these two separate events. And I want to read you the best quote that I've heard on this subject from the great Martin Landau, the actor. Um, and Martin Landau said this, in a well-written script, what people say to each other, the dialogue, is what a character's willing to reveal, willing to share with another person. The 90% he or she isn't willing to share is what I do for a living. The 90% he or she isn't willing to share is what we do for a living. That's what we're doing. We're trying to serve on a silver platter what we feel and what we mean to the point where our audience, if they can't hear, if they're, they're deaf um, or they're, they, they, they simply can't hear, their eyes can see what you mean. They can catch an attitude because their eyes are picking up on it and your face is accessible. They're catching an attitude. Fred Rogers of Mr. Rogers said something so beautiful. One of the most beautiful things you can do in life, and I think in art too, is for somebody to catch an attitude from you that something is fun, even if it's dark to catch an attitude. And um, yeah, so again, this is towards dangerous acting. And I wanna share with you a great quote from Marlon Brando that supports this. Marlon Brando said it really, really well. He said, never let an audience know how it's gonna come out. If you obey character description and stage action directions, people are gonna know how it's gonna come out. It's like a piece of art that labels itself. You don't wanna create art that labels itself, you guys. You wanna create a ticket to talk, a ticket to a conversation and give that to your audience to pull them in versus to let them know what it is so that they no longer have to feel it. Essentially, what you're trying to do is you wanna throw your audience off balance because you're off, off balance with your choices. Remember all the times I talk about Joaquin Phoenix and he talks about embracing that place where he doesn't know what it's going to be. Embracing that off-balance pl place. And to do that, you need to have the bravery to do very bad things with regards to your choices. To make, um, to make choices on the piece, on your pieces that are non-linear. So I'm going to continue with the Marlon Brando quote. Never let the audience know how it's going to come out. Get them on your time. And when that time comes and everything is right, Marlon said it, you just fucking let it fly. He said, hit him, knock him over with an attitude, with a word, with a look, be surprising. 
And here's where he says it best. Figure out a way to do it that had never been done before. You want to stop that movement from the popcorn to the mouth. Get people to stop chewing. The truth will do that. The truth of what we feel and what we mean versus what we say. And he said, when it's right, it's right. You can feel it in your bones. You can feel it in your bones, deep in your bones. And it's cathartic and it's fun and it's empowering. And then Brando says, then you feel whole, then you feel good. And that's from Marlon Brando. And I always talk about this is that you great actors know the work is great because you feel it. Not because somebody, don't let someone give you a, a, a critique or feedback or you watch yourself on tape. That's not how you know the work is great. Great actors know the work is great because they feel it. And one of the first things that we feel is that it's fun. And if you're obeying, you're doing what you think you were supposed to do, when is that ever fun? When does that ever stand out? When does that ever pop somebody's eyes off their laptop? It doesn't. So if it doesn't feel fun, it's not working. Cathartic, empowered, invigorated, alive, fun. And also, the other three, if it doesn't feel effortless, easy and loose, it's not fun. If you're not having impact, it's not fun. Or as Michael J. Fox says, finding an opportunity to surprise your partner every time. And lastly, if it doesn't feel like you, like your version of it, it's not working. Not like you're playing yourself, your version of it, you under the influence of the work. Think about it like that. And always asking yourself, under what conditions would it be possible to, for me to feel this? Think about it like this. Think of acting like this, you guys. We see such a spectrum these days of suffering, of beauty, um, of danger, surprise. And when we look out our windows or we're on the street and we're looking at someone experiencing great suffering or great joy um, in a relationship, you just ask yourself, if it were me, how would that feel? Putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. That's what we do for a living, you guys. Putting yourself in somebody's shoes. So asking yourself, if it were me, how would I feel? What would that be like for me? And that's what I want you to do with your characters. Not you with all of your, you know, we're not trying to relate and identify based on our past experience. Everything that's happened to you is right there in you right now. The reason we don't want to go back to the time we were 12 years old and dig up some childhood trauma or childhood ecstasy is not because we're not similar. It's because the meaning of the past has changed. We've processed things. We're going to be trying to stick a round peg into a square hole. We're going to think we're going to getting, might be getting close to it, but the meaning of the past changes. I grew up in, in Boston near Fenway Park and, um, you know, it's like I could be nostalgic and imagine what it would be like to be back there and you could get close to it, but you're not going to feel exactly what you felt at that time because we've processed, I've processed those emotions. So, yeah, so don't get stuck in the trap, uh, the trap. And remember, you guys, you cannot... You cannot create and please at the same time in any field, whether it's acting or, or relationships or in any field, you cannot please and create. It doesn't work. Your job was never to go in and please a casting director. Um, does that make sense? It's sort of like your ability to get in and out of the room gracefully and, and be gracious. And that, that is so important. But with the acting, you're never trying to guess what they're looking for. You're always assuming that you are who they are looking for and you're bringing yourself to the piece with a brave and fun choice. And in the discussion in a second, I wanna know what you guys think of that. In life, when you're looking at something that's fascinating to you and you ask yourself, come on, haven't we ever asked ourselves outside of an acting environment, how would I feel? What would that be like for me? My gosh, not only could I do that, could I live that life, you're gonna find that it's easier than you thought to relate to it. And it doesn't make you insane. It doesn't make you a villain. Someone said, if you remember who had said, a philosopher, a psychologist, there's a villain in all of us. There's a monster in all of us. There's a saint in all of us. And it's having the bravery, um, it's having the bravery to indulge in those fantasies and know that it doesn't make you a monster. It's actually cathartic and it's healing. 
So you can't create and please at the same time. And I talk about this all the time. And, you know, the feedback from the producers and directors and casting, when you guys booked the roles, it was always a result of you standing out and your bravery and going against the grain of what everybody else did. Um, JJ Abrams wrote a personal email to one of my friends, one of our teachers at the studio, Annie Chang, when she booked a, a series regular on one of his last pilots. And he said, thank you for being the, the only one willing to take a risk with your choice. That was the one reason why I could tell Showtime, we've, we have our actor, we don't need to see anybody else. And there's a wonderful story. I don't know if you guys watch the show Barry, but it's a great show. Uh, Henry, Winker, Henry Winkler, Bill Hader. Anyway, so Bill Hader and Alec Berg were talking about the casting of Henry Winkler, and he was not an obvious choice for the role. And he said he was so wonderful and he was so surprising. They said it wasn't at all what we were looking for. It was better. And it's like, it, it, it goes back to that. It wasn't at all what we were looking for. It's better. So you really do need to leave the dimension of what you thought you were supposed to do. And remember, you cannot solve the problem of how to play the character in your head or in your mind. I can't stress that enough because you're, you're going to get stuck on that idea and it's going to inhibit and stifle your discovery of that character. And feel free to talk about that because... I want to get into the Q&A with you guys uh, rather soon, but I really wanted to riff on different ways of looking at why the stage directions and the character description, why that would be so low dimensional in terms of your choices. And again, if you think I'm telling you to ignore the stage directions or ignore the character descriptions, I'm not telling you to ignore them, okay? They're just, were never your marching orders as an actor. It's for you to figure out under, because your version of those character descriptions, stage directions, your version of that, that's what's always wanted. And we can sort of cross paths with this discussion when we're talking about dangerous acting as well, too, because this is towards dangerous acting. So um, as fun as it is for me to talk to you guys, it's even more fun to engage with you guys. And we have so many wonderful people who I, some of you I know very well, and I'd like to hang with here and, um, and talk about some of these subjects and open some of this stuff up. All right. So do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? It's okay. Throw out some, you know, challenging opinions here. Um, super. Let's see. So I'm going to take some questions here and then we can kind of keep the question. You can ask me whatever you want, but let's keep it geared towards, um, you know, making these dangerous choices. You think of in life too. You have some, uh, a plan in life. You can only plan in your head so much. So other than planning in my head, what do I do? You talk it out loud. You use your words to create. You use your words to discover. Um, and come and watch the work too, if you haven't already. Come and watch the actors get their work out. We have, it's so exciting right now. One of our classes, we have over 30 celebrity actors, just as many major writer, director, producers, and we are creating, co-creating original content out of the classes with writers and actors, original content for major studios right now. So we invite you guys to come watch uh, at your convenience. And you can just go to the website, www.josephperlman.com, hit the contact form, and we'll set you up with a free audit. And it's P-E-A-R-L-M-A-N. All right. Okay. Nivia Margarita. So we get a lot of questions about this. What if this? What if someone doesn't like it? What if somebody gets angry at it? What if they don't like it? What is your advice if at any point at an audition the producers get offended with their choices? Do we gracefully thank them and leave? No, you don't gracefully thank them. You have to realize that you are not below them. You need to adopt the attitude that we are all in the same boat. And if life hasn't proven that at this point, I don't know what will. We are all people. We are all in the same boat. Production and casting continually tells me this. And we hear it from actors all the time. We can always pull you back to a safer, lower, obvious dimension. We can always pull you back, but we can never pull that brave choice out of you if you didn't have the courage to do it. And keep in mind, a brave choice is not just saying, hey, I, I want to become an actor. And in six weeks, auditioning for a major role. No, it is, I truly love acting. I want to dedicate myself to a process where I'm working regularly, where I have a break. It is possible, you guys, every time you work, 
to have an undeniable acting breakthrough and transformation every single time you get up, guaranteed, okay? It's possible to crack a scene in three minutes if you need to. Um, so don't, don't have your scene stretch out for weeks. It's possible to get a grip on it and break through every time. That being said, you don't want to sort of take a tuba and say, I want to play the tuba, and then six weeks audition for the head of the L LA Philharmonic. You want to love acting. We do it because it makes us feel amazing. Someone said it's like, it's like a drug. They get high on it. We, we light ourselves up. And we want to get great. So it's important to get great and learn how to make dangerous choices. So big, brave choices are not about being loud or revved up or, or amped or supercharged. It's making emotionally dangerous against the grain choices. Here's an example of a choice like that. So Nivea, do not go into a room with your tail tucked between your legs. You are not below these people. You are all in the same boat. Does anybody remember the great movie, A Fish Called Wanda? Uh, it's so good. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Kevin Klein is in it. And um, some of the, a lot of the Monty Python cast. But Kevin Klein plays a guy with an, a massive anger management issue. But he plays it opposite of someone with an anger management issue. At times, he's trying to be calm. He'll say, you know, like, I'm fine. Everything's good. I'm fine. I'm fine. And then he'll, you know... And he'll lash out with an asshole, you know, and then the anger management will come raging back in. So it's a really fun example of someone who plays against the grain with an obvious choice. And so if you're playing someone with an anger management issue, the obvious choice is to be a rageaholic and rage throughout the whole piece. You want to explore emotions that are opposite to anger, because when those opposite emotions hit the text, they chemically react to create something that you cannot be aware of. Remember, stop trying to control what other people see, okay? My friend Alex Ashinger, uh, producer, writer, actor, fellow coach at the studio always says that you can't control what other people see. Everybody's going to see something different. So again, get that pleasing mindset out of your minds. You cannot create. You cannot book high-level work. You cannot do truly transformative acting and be trying to please at the same time. Um, Brett, thank you so much. Um, amazing advice. Never would have thought to be risky in auditions. Well, good. I'm glad this, I'm, I'm glad it's useful. Um, I always thought the description is a defined box, not a shapeless set of recommendations. Yeah. So it, it, it's, um, again, don't ignore them, but it's part of understanding the world. It's, it's a guideline. It's like, here's what it could be. It's your job to show us something that we never thought was possible. Remember the words of Dion of Reland, former editor of Vogue. She discovered incredible talent like Barbara Streisand, Angelica Houston. She said, as one of the as one of the leading editors of Vogue, one of the best editors of Vogue before Anna Winter, she said, I wanted to show people what they didn't know they wanted yet. That's what I want you guys to do. I want you to kick the reference point away. I want you to walk into the room as if to say, you don't know what this is going to be. And I might not know what this is going to be. I want you to embrace the off balance, embrace the chaos of that. So I wanted to show people what they didn't know they wanted yet. And one of my favorite lines is from Jack Nicholson's Joker, which was something to the effect of, wait till they get a load of me. It was like, I think it was, wait till they get a load of me, as only Jack Nicholson can do. And I'm not going to do Jack Nicholson right now. That's the attitude you guys to have to have when you go on set or you go into an audition, wait till they get a load of me. Who's your favorite musician? You think David Bowie? You think Jack White? Um, do you think, do you think, you know what I'm saying? They're going to do their deal and they're going to realize nothing's ever the same. That's the other thing too. Your callbacks, your chemistry reads, it's not the same. You were not supposed to do the same thing you did in the first read in the callback. It's let's see what's more. What's different? Let's see. Let, let's keep discovering here. So if anything from this conversation, I want you guys, I'm going to give you guys permission to be brave. Bravery is that thing that separates the doers from the dreamers, that separates the folks just starting off from the folks who have spent six seasons on Game of Thrones. Remember, as my friend Eugene Simon says, who played Lancel Lannister on six seasons of Game of Thrones, one of our master class members, he said, it doesn't get easier. You just get braver. Let's see. Um, 
Oh, Vincent, good. I'm, I'm glad it feels true to you. I recently made some dangerous choices, you said, and received great feedback and got the part. Excellent. Yes. I'm not sending you into the fire with this advice. This is how you get from point A to point B. This is how you, if you're, as Jason Bateman says, you're just one job away from the next big thing in your career. This is one of the things that's going to help you teleport versus having to climb the rungs of the ladder. So good. Um, Justin Sand, yay, Justin. Hey, Joseph, be what they didn't expect or thought they wanted. Yes. Um, good, Deborah. All I care about, listen, if something doesn't have utility and isn't useful, you know, what's the point? Um, I also want to give you guys permission, if I haven't already, to eliminate anything from your professional lives that aggravates you, that's aggravating. Because if something is aggravating in the moment, when you leave that moment, it's going to take up 80% of your headspace. And you don't want something like that in your headspace. So cut out from your lives, in your professional lives, anything or anyone who is aggravating, okay? I realize in personal relationships, um, it's worth working sometimes. I'm talking about you and your professional lives, okay? I'm not giving relationship advice here. I'm, I'm talking about your acting career stuff. Um, Good. Let's see. Donna Kelly. I've done this with video auditions and done the scene many ways, but I end up sending the one I like. Should I be sending all the variations? Um, no. You have many different choices. How do you know which one is the right one? It's never the one you think they're going to like. It's the one that's more fun for you. You need to trust how you feel. Your emotions are your marker for how things are going in life and in acting. Is it mostly feeling good or is it mostly feeling not good? And you need to trust that, not to think whether it was working or not working. Um, yeah, good, 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 good. Um, and here's something you can do. You need to think in terms of strategy, okay? You typically want to send one take. Just like when you go in person, uh, virtual or in person, you don't want to say, hey, listen, I did it. Can I do it again? Because they're going to think you've second-guessed your choice, and they may have typically loved your first choice, but now here you are second-guessing yourself, and it can really tank an audition, so you commit to one. That being said, when you're sending a tape, you have the option to send an alternate if you want to, if it's truly contrasting. If the alternate is in the same dimension choice-wise as the first one, don't do it. It's not worth it. And here's a little hack. Here's a little um, tip slash hack is that... Let's say you have an audition with three scenes or two scenes. Every actor is going to send it in the order one, two, three. Or if it's two scenes, scene one, faded into scene two. Um, you have the ability, should you want to, not every time, but again, as a strategy, everything should be approached with crystal clear strategy. You have the choice to start with scene two and then go to scene one to sort of change the order, to show them an order they've never seen before. It's a well-calculated risk uh, and it's paid off quite a bit sometimes. So you need to think strategically like that uh, with everything that you guys do. Good. Um, so yeah, don't send all the variations. Oh, good. <laughs> Sindora, ready? For, yeah, ready for your meeting tomorrow. Good. I just want you guys to feel great, feel empowered, to know that anything capable of being done, you can do. So let's do it. I also said something in the last talk that got cut off, but I put in the video chat um, a little hack on the resume. Uh, it got cut off and I wanted to repeat it and I promised you guys I would, is between your contact, your name and contact information. And by the way, you should never have your personal cell phone and your personal email it sort of screams that the actor is not professional enough yet so you can create a business email or a business phone. But between your contact information and your credits, to have a, a, a sort of a banner in all bold, in all caps of your most exciting credit or the thing that you're most excited about, whether it's like the name of the role, whether it was a film or TV project, maybe the production company, it's the first thing somebody's eyes are gonna bump on and see before they get down. If they don't read your resume, it's just something their eyes are going to bump on and it's going to, you're putting, you're putting it in front of somebody. So it's all caps, all bold, spaced out nicely, just sort of a banner and you can rotate it. Let's say you get a, a recurring role or a co-star or a guest star role. You just change that top banner on your resume. So I also put it in the comment for the last video. Um, let's see, Jessica, Lorian, what are your thoughts on stage directions that include actions, throw, punch, turn away? How do you know which to honor and which to make your own? This is a great question, Jessica. Um, and it's awesome working with you, by the way. Jessica is so talented. 
she, Jessica's in our Wednesday class. Um, you can come and watch that if you haven't watched one of those classes. You do silence like I've never seen anybody else do. So there's certain styles where those action directions um, can be important. And those styles are in Disney, Nickelodeon, motion capture, which is for video game, virtual reality, some of the bigger, more theater-like styles where it's a guideline. So essentially what you're trying to do in your auditions is you want to give somebody the on-set version of your piece. You never want to do the audition version. You want to show them what they're going to get on set. So what you need to do for those bigger styles where sometimes you're really, you're really throwing your body into it more, it's it's, it's just as much shown and physicalized as it's emotionalized. What you wanna do for those bigger styles is you wanna find your version of those actions. So you don't wanna just puppet what it says on the page, Jessica. You wanna find what your version of those actions are. So if somebody in that scene sort of kicks you um, and, and it says you crumple to the floor, well, if I crumple to the floor, I'm gonna go out of frame, but I wanna react to that kick and I might want to fall on, I might want to get pushed to the back wall and then come back. So again, you want to give them what they're going to get on set, but you want to do your version of them, not what you think they want based on the stage direction. So same thing if it says like, if it says, this is one of the big ones, actors get stuck on it, it says, she cries here, she sobs uncontrollably, <laughs> you know, it, it, it looks like it's micromanaging your performance. Well, guess what? That means that there's potentially, potential, potentially a big emotional moment. But if you just play the result of the crying, it's going to be hollow versus your version of that emotion, which is going to be a spectrum blast of emotion that is going to be so much more substantial than just someone that tries to get to tears. Does that make sense? So again, it always goes back to, I need to figure out under what conditions would push me into a place of deep emotion. Crying is a result, okay? So don't just say, I have to ding that. You are released from the responsibility of having to cry where you think it says to cry on cue because you're gonna have a, an emotional relief release that's much more dangerous and scary and change affecting and impactful than an actor that just tries to hit that cry on that particular line. So it's a good question. Certain bigger styles to watch out for. Here's an example too. One of the rules in auditions is that you don't mime, okay? There's no miming um, and no props either. The only acceptable prop for the most part is a phone if you need it, but turned off so the lights don't go on. And um, yeah, so no, so, so no props and no mime, but the exception to that rule of no mime is for styles that are large, like Disney, Nickelodeon, multi-camera, virtual reality, motion capture work, um, VR, you know, the bigger styles where you can, where you can do some of those broad mimes. Um, the reason we don't mime in an audition is not because I say we don't, it's because mime is so specific, okay? Anything general is the death of good art. And actors study mime for three years at the Lecoq School in France. They study for three years and it's so specific that just mime is so unspecific that it can really pull somebody out. So there's, you know, there's not a black and white. There's some exceptions here. But under no conditions were you ever supposed to obey the stage directions. It's always trying to figure out a way to do your version because it's going to be better. Just like if somebody says... There's a great example, um, I believe it's from uh, David, Ma uh, David Mamet gives, or if somebody says, you're the queen of France, um, audiences by nature are so highly suggestible. Oh, Melissa Bruder, a practical handbook for the actor, it comes from that. Audiences by nature are so suggestible. If someone has told Jessica that you're the queen of France, they're gonna buy it unless you violate the spirit of it. It's never your job to figure out how to play the queen of France. It's your job to figure out what it means to you under what conditions um, would it be possible for me to feel the Queen of France? Let's see here. A couple more questions here. Good. Uh, Donna says, I've been fortunate to get work through choosing my own, but questioned my choice. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to recommend a particular email. I'm just going to recommend 
on your resume that you, you don't put a number in an email that looks like someone has personal access to you. It's a security issue as well. Whether you're, um, whatever gender you are, you don't want somebody like personally being able to reach you. It's a privacy, it's a security issue. And it also, the actors that you are, the actors that you're going to be, you're not gonna have your personal contact information on there. So you can dress it up. You can find a way to make it look like a business email. Um, Donna.Kelly Productions or something like that. Exactly. Um, oh, okay, well, JC Cadenia, have you ever experienced the new virtual auditioning? Any tools you can share? This virtual auditioning has been going on for years. Uh, tapes, auditions via you know video. So it's the same rules. And I always say to you guys, don't get whipped up with your acting preparation. If you're going into a live audition, don't get whipped up with what you're going to do acting wise before you walk in the room because you're going to miss the opportunity for them to be interviewed as you. So um, I really do recommend, it, by the way, how cool is it to be able to audition like this in the medium that we work in, film and TV? It's so terrific to see in real time. That's why the classes are so awesome is that you can see in real in the moment. It's like the best version of on-camera work is being able to see yourself live in the moment, not watching your playback. Watching playback is a useful tool, but doing it every week is making a fetish over it. And also, not every actor should be watching their play playback. It can be toxic. So permission from me to you to not have to be force-fed your playback if you don't want to watch it. It's a useful tool. But if you can't look at yourself like an editor, um, it can be downright toxic. And some of the best actors in the world know never to watch their playback, like Meryl Streep and Javier Bardem, et cetera. Yes. Um, good, let's see here. Uh, so yeah, virtual auditioning, it's like the same thing, you guys, but you wanna, you wanna make a connection. You wanna, you wanna go into these rooms, you guys, not because you want something. You wanna leave your wants or needs for things at the door. It's gonna get in the way of showing people who you are. You wanna go into these rooms as if you're, you're going in to make a couple friends. You wanna make it about them, not about you. Do you know? It's like they're sussing out what you're gonna be like to hang out with for a couple years or a year. So be your wonderful selves. When you walk into an audition room as you, it's more about what you don't wanna bring in. And we work on that at the studio. Sometimes the actors, in lieu of working on a scene study for a book role or any number of audition style pieces, want to work on the them that's coming into the room and we support and facilitate that. Uh, let's see. Cool. Just another question or two, but again, thank you. Thank you for hanging out with me today. It is a privilege. It is an honor uh, to get to talk to you. And thank you again to backstage for everything that you guys do to support this amazing community of actors. Um, JC Cadenia, I can't look at myself. That's what Javier Bardem said. He said, I can't, that nose, that, that effing nose, that effing face, I can't look. It doesn't matter. It's okay if you can't watch yourself, your playback. So, so let it go. If it, again, does it feel awesome to do it? Then do it. But just know that what you see in playback is a result. And it's not going to tell you whether the acting was great. You're going to, you have full control over knowing when something is working or not no, working and knowing when you're at your Olympic best as an actor, hundred um, percent. Another question. So welcome, Brett. Good. Like I said, if these are useful there, that's great. If it has utility for you, that's the only way I want to do this. Um, awesome. Awesome. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Eleanor. Okay, I'm finding it hard to make these big choices with self-taped auditions when it's just myself in my basement acting against a wall. Any thoughts? One, don't just act with yourself in a basement. You should have a reader. I'm assuming you have a reader, but you should have a reader. You can get a reader from anywhere in the world and work via video. There's a way to set it up. You're talking to a reader. Um, and remember, standout choices are not about being big. It's about being emotionally against the grain. It's not obeying emotionally the text all the time, okay? So again, it's not your volume or your bigness. It's how emotionally crazy can you go inside of a contained structure? What's the structure that you get to go crazy inside is a great question. Um, it's a question that Sean, Sean Penn um, also worked with my mentor, Jeff Corey, and Sean Penn talks about that as well. He describes it as every film project, he needs to understand what's the structure that I get to go crazy inside. Do you guys get that you get to go crazy inside of a structure and you need to be filling that out. 
And so one thing I'll leave you with before we head out today is one little, little tip trick is always ask yourself every line is the text. Listen to the text. Is it telling me that I can have more fun? Okay. Can I have more fun inside the structure? Oftentimes you can have more fun than you think. Okay. I think another video to possibly do is, you know, a lot has been made about when you get a co-star or a smaller role or a commercial that you, you want to do less. Um, that's not true. That is not accurate advice. You're going crazier inside of a smaller structure, perhaps, but in no way um, should you not be making all of the choices that you would be making if you had booked the lead in a Ridley Scott movie, except you're, you're within a different structure. So um, let's see. How do we get the dangerous choices faster? I'll tell you how to get to the dangerous choices faster. Um, let go of your idea of who he or she is immediately and start to discover it out loud. Like I said, come watch the work in one of the classes should you want to for free. You can reach out on our website to do that. www.josephperlman.com and hit the contact and we'll, we'll see each other very soon because we have a lot of awesome content throughout the week for you guys. Um, good, and you guys, yes. I never ask you to like the video, but if you can, if you can like the video, that'd be super, super, super cool. I love you guys. Thank you for being interested. Thank you for, you know, giving a shit about this. I love this. I nerd out on it and I love working with people. I love working with you guys who truly love acting as well. It's like a way to live, you know, it's an incredible way to live. Every, you know, all of this advice can be applied to other scenarios. And as some of you guys know, I also work with folks who are not actors, who are leaders in the health, doctors without borders, coaching TED Talks, uh, brokering, you know, brokering meetings between, you know, the UN and some dangerous organizations and stuff. And all the same work, all the same work applies. You guys are so welcome. Again, so much love and um, appreciation for you all being here. And I hope to see you very soon. Um, check out another fun video on uh, two weeks from today and I do appreciate you liking the video. You can follow, uh, follow us, follow me on Instagram and Joseph Perlman. And I hope to see you at a free audit soon. Take care. And thank you again to backstage for, um, for all of the support on this video and everything that you guys are doing. All right, cool. Awesome. Very cool. Be well.